good evening. Our discussion on topical issues affecting Guyana. You know, it is often said that Guyana is a place where you ought never to be surprised. The Christmas holidays were going quite smoothly. The hustle and bustle of shopping until the night of December 21st, Friday, when almost out of the blue, a vote of no confidence in the government was passed with the support of one member of the government side. A few days later, there came the announcement of a new political party, the cornerstone of its platform being constitutional reform for inclusive government. Governance, sorry. Four of the leading or the announced leaders of that group, Messrs. Ralph Ramkaran, Timothy Jonas, Terence Campbell, and political guru and consultant Dr. Henry Jeffrey, were identified as the leaders with a possible involvement at some later stage of indigenous leader Lennox Schumann and his Liberal and Justice Party. Then came early January, when the New Year was barely a week old, when one of the leaders of the ANUG, Mr. Terence Campbell, withdrew from the party, indicating that he did not feel that he could add value to the efforts of the party in the days ahead. He also withdrew from RISE, a civil society group of which he was one of the leading faces. To assist us, in understanding and putting the common thread uh, of all these apparently disparate events, our two leaders of the ANUG, Dr. Henry Jeffrey and Mr. Timothy Jonas, who I would like to welcome on Plain Talk as leaders of ANUG. Thank you very much, Chris. Thank you, Chris. You, the announcement said that the party will be launched. I think there was an announcement in the, on Christmas Day. Mm -hmm. It was reported in the press. The party has not yet been launched. Is that correct? Yes. That's correct. And when is that likely to happen? Mm, not a week or two. A tentative launch date is fixed for the 18th. We are trying to stick to that because we've already procrastinated long enough. But we are thinking of the 18th is it. Why do you say procrastinate? Is it because you, because you were take my surprise, like the whole of Ghana, I think in terms of launching an organization? You're quite right. The whole of Ghana was taken by surprise. Um, and as you know, what has happened since has disastrously polarized um, our people. I think that that is what prompted us to decide that a moderate voice needed to be heard. And we hope that a moderate voice, a tiny voice, um, can hopefully pour some oil on the water so that there is a middle ground that people can look to rather than being enmeshed in what is becoming an increasingly polarized situation. Dr. Jeffrey? Well, I think uh, Tim has explained it uh, relatively well. We have had this idea of doing the party for some time. But you are indeed correct that uh, the no confidence motion and the notion that the elections will be in three months did uh, pressure us maybe to come a week or two earlier. But I, I did believe that we were saying that we were going to launch in January anyway. But we might have had, you know, been forced to do so a week or two earlier. The whole idea is to force the two parties to do what Guyana needs. Uh, our flagship idea, as you know, is the idea of constitutional reform uh, that maybe you have about 20 things we can should reform in the Constitution, but we want to pay particular attention to creating a kind of government or kind of governance that would allow all of our people 
to feel that their interests are being looked after. The entire system of governance is Ga in Guyana, this winner takes all. And now when they are taking all, they are only taking a minute <laughs> majority. Uh, uh, re results in the Sharandas kind of operation or the prorogation kind of operation. The governments must now, rather than mining the people's business in, the, uh, in this era of oil, uh, we are, they have to pay a lot of attention to their political life because they are, they are winning by very small majorities. That's where we have gotten to, and we believe that's a waste of time. It has been a waste of time for, more, for the most part for the last 70 years, um, but we believe that we, as ter old Terrence put it, we can add some value to this by being a group that says we are going to uh, push for this thing, we are going to make this happen. In, in that statement that came out, uh, um, it was said that we were all very impressed with the APNU plus AFC manifesto promise to implement reforms of our constitution that would allow separate presidential elections. Now, one of the issues about this business of constitutional reform and inclusive governance is that the, the average person on the street isn't quite sure how this translates to food on the table. To money to send the children to school. How how do you how does NUG um, deliver that? W what mechanism? The ordinary man might not be aware of uh, the nitty gritty of what it is that we are talking about when we speak about constitutional reform. But he knows one thing. A house divided is that a house going to fall. And he knows that what's going on out there, the disunity is costly for him and costly for Guyana. He knows that. He has seen what you have been saying in, in, in various forums and of, about various issues. The suboptimal decision-making processes that exist because we are quarreling with each other more than trying to aid each other. You have been, and others have been telling us about the billions we have lost in this oil negotiation, for instance. And these things can be, uh, can result or ricochet to the advantage of people when we can all sit together, united in effort to move this country forward. The mere fact that people don't feel that they are, they are one. The mere fact that we do not have a people in Guyana. I, I, I saw one of the great professors were saying that uh, a few days ago, I've been saying it for the longest time. Well, we have a different peoples. We have Indian people, we have black people. We have no way of pressuring the government. Black people would not pressure their government. Indian people would not pressure their government to come on board and let us come together on a united thing on almost anything. Look at this Sharandas thing. Similarly, he's a hero, he's a criminal. A bandit. We, unless we can stop this, unless we can come together and make the decision that we can all agree upon, Guyana will remain as poor as it is, regardless of all, relatively poor. We have had all the resources in the world, and look where we are. You, you know, Chris, you, you talk about how to explain this to the, the small man, but the people, of, the people out there are no idiots. There are no fools there. Mm -hmm. And if you speak to either side of the two groups, if you speak to their supporters, no one is happy. And there is a realization that the political situation in Guyana is a vicious cycle. If you vote based on ethnic affinity, you are not voting based on merit. Mm -hmm. If you're not voting based on merit, you will necessarily have people of declining competence, people of declining merit going into the party and winning your vote because the electorate is not looking at them and analyzing them to assess their worth. And when you have people of reduced capacity, reduced efficiency going into power, 
you have a vicious cycle. So when you speak to the average voter, the average voter is going to say, oh my God, these people are too corrupt. And on the other side, the average voter might say, these people are, are not doing their job, they're not providing jobs, they're not showing that they're competent. But every single voter is going to say they're better than the others. They're better mm -hmm. than the other side. Mm -hmm. And what is amazing in Guyana is that although you're not happy with your side, the temperature is ramped up so high in this discussion between two groups, neither of whom is happy. Because they justify it by saying better than the other guy. Now, the average man on the street who is not happy with his own person, not happy with his own group, has begun to realize, and I think the voters have matured enough that you are seeing that realization, and you've seen it in terms of the demographics of votes and in terms of the success that the AFC had before they were subsumed. But the realization is coming that you cannot have one of two choices. You must have something else. Because the failing in our system, and our system is inherently flawed, because if you vote for one or for the other, if you have only two parties, then mathematically speaking, the party that has won also wins parliament and therefore takes the entire cake so that the 49% that is left back gets zero. Which and is what happened is, with this exact That and, is and what has happened with us yeah. forever. And that needs to change. Now, gentlemen, we've heard lots of parties come up and die. Dr. Jeffrey, you, you, your columns are replete. With, with examples and we're talking over decades. You mentioned the AFC, the, the WPA um, once held a very prominent position, if not electorally, within the, 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 the thoughts and, and, and minds of the people. What is different about ANUG? First of all, I think that what the other parties did, well, not all of them, certainly the UF and, uh, uh, and then the FC, they sh took a shot at the government of the day, or they tried to say that both parties, as Tim was saying, are terrible. We, we will have nothing to do with them. And then forced into a cul-de-sac of our constitution, which says to you that, uh, the party with the majority will always have the presidency and all that sort of thing. The FC was forced to uh, join with the APNU to wrench the PPP from office. And they have stuck there, but they had an opportunity. The point is that we, as we see ourselves, we are not really, we are going there to try to make these two parties work together. We need leverage to do that. We want the leverage to say to them, you have to work together. That's why we have stated clearly, I believe, that we will join no part political <laughs> parties. We have also said we want no position in any of these parties. I certainly don't want. I've been there for 17 years. I certainly don't want to be around this thing. But this is important for Guyana, and we have said what no other party in this country has ever said, and maybe in the entire Caribbean, we are going to make those, imp those two things justiciable, if possible. And perhaps you will write the law to <laughs> make that <laughs> no, happen. No, no, I think okay. that's going to be difficult. <laughs> I thought of that, but we don't want to go. Yeah. Um, the good objectives, um, but as I said, it's been tried before. Well, it did, you what say it's is been tried, but as Henry points out, the UF was subsumed. Yes. The in, AFC in a coalition. In what, a coalition. What happens is that when the small party joins the large party and succeeds into government, the inevitable happens. The party who's left out becomes the enemy. And what we need to realize in Ghana is that we have two parties that are whole in themselves and that are viable in themselves. Neither party is the enemy. Each party has good, competent people, and each party has racist and incompetent people. So if we step back, as I hope Guyanese can do, step back from the vitriol and observe that there are good people in each party, there are bad people in each party, and what Guyana needs is a situation where the system that is inherently flawed must be fixed. 
that will enable the good people to come out. Which system are you talking about? The system that, uh, that allows two parties, one seemingly representing one ethnic group, the other representing the other ethnic group, to be clashing so that you have one winner and 49% of the people disenfranchised. That cannot go on. And the, one, the thing is, the rules of the game now permit that and mandate that. And the, the reward is so great that when the party is in opposition, the party talks about constitutional reform because they're out, they have zero. Mm -hmm. But as soon as the party gets in, the party has 100. And suddenly constitutional reform becomes meaningless because the party has everything. So a th if, as long as you only have two parties, you have that problem. You need a third force who will commit. We will continue to be a third force. We will not join either of the two parties. We recognize that it is the system that is flawed, not the individuals. Now, third forces, even in societies that don't have a tenth of the polarization, I mean, you have this, the social democrats, the liberals in the UK, you yeah. had cop, cop in Trinidad. Yeah. Third parties have an inherent challenge. Um, how are you? How do you, what, what leads to the optimism that you, this time it will be different, that this group will make that difference? Well, well let me say this, that first of all, in, as we have just demonstrated in terms of about, about the AFC and the UF, they did make an inroad, sufficient yes. of, a, of an inroad to make a difference. The problem was that they got sucked into governance and sucked into governance in terms of the UF. <laughs> it's almost similar to the FC, but the UF was in the time of geopolitical quarrels between the Soviet Union and the, P and, uh, the United States. And, or what we call the era of containment, and the idea was that the UF and the PNC will get together to keep the PPP out of government. It's almost like we're saying, look, the AFC has got to come together with the APNU just to get rid of the PPP, mm -hmm. but for the very the different reasons. So the UF, being a more or less West capitalist kind of Western party, made the decision to go with Burnham. Well, little did they know that by doing so, Mr. Bor and giving Mr. Burnham the power and all of that, Mr. Burnham decided he's going to stay here. And it was not, it would not have served Western interests to shake the boat and tell Burnham to be democratic because then they would have ended up in the PVP. So Mr. Burnham recognized that and the UF was nowhere. So today, we have almost a similar thing. We, we, we all of us, maybe you, I'm saying to, to we were quarreling with the FC, join the app, <laughs> join, join the app, you know, so we can get rid of the PVP. So they join the app, app you now. And, and we, we, let me make myself quite clear. I would never have supported the, the, the APNU if, I, if they did not commit to constitutional change. Remember, everything, that, it, it's ironic, but everything we are doing here. Uh, our, our, our flagship program, uh, as a matter of fact, is precisely what the APNU promised to do and never do it. Did when they, they, they got their 100%, as Tim says. So we are now having to pick up the thing and try to run with it. So, so that is why I actually believe that, and there are lots of people that vote for them out there. A whole lot of people vote for them because they believe this should have stopped. And these people, will, I believe, support them. They are not hardwired to the PNC as maybe 30%, 29%, 30% of this, this population is. I believe they are fed up with what's going on, and they will support us. Why different? I, I just want to repeat the question. Um, what, why do you think it's going to be different this time with, with you people leading, well, in the leadership role? As I said before, um, I believe the voters have matured. They're for four years in Guyanese society, until the fifth year when there's an electoral cycle, 
Guyanese live together harmoniously. We go to the masjid and we go to funerals and we go to weddings. We go to the church and we go to funerals and weddings. We commiserate with our friends. We celebrate with our friends. We, we are, in my experience, a shining example of harmonious relations. Um, the number of mixed marriages, mixed relations that you see is a sign of that. I don't believe that in Guyana there is that sense of ethnic superiority by one ethnicity over the other that there is in so many other parts of the world. We get along. We rub shoulders, we sit at the same table and we eat. Um, how does that translate into such a huge problem every five years? The fact is that because the population has matured, because the electorate has matured, and because the electorate saw what was possible when the AFC was a third force, sitting in parliament, not using their power as they could have, but with that power, with the power that they had, they could have done a lot of good. And I think the electorate realized that. And because when in 2015 there was this enormous groundswell of goodwill, because the AFC had joined up, the disappointment has not led, I think, to a total disillusionment by everybody. A lot of people are disillusioned and may, may move away. But that groundswell of support and that hope that the electorate have and the recognition at the time that something good could come of this, even in the existing framework of rules that is so unfair, you um, I, I think that the electorate still have a hope. It's a minority in the electorate because, as Henry says, 30% on one side are high bound. They will never change. 30% on the other side are high bound and will never change. It might be 40 on either side, fine. Mm -hmm. But that 20% is not happy. The rest aren't happy either, but they'll never change. We can live with that. We have to live with that because that's how it is. But the 20% that can change, I think they have had enough and have the maturity to step back, take a breath, and try to find a solution a solution is what we need, and a solution is what no one is trying to... And you think the right ANUG now. can offer that solution? I, I, I want to take your, 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 your cornerstone of your platform is inclusive government, governance. Mm -hmm. But yet you say, even if you're the best person to fit a ministerial portfolio, you will not accept. No member of the ANUG party in a, will accept because the position. Guyanese have been bitten twice. And when I say Guyanese, I mean the three Guyanese here as well. We have seen and we've had the hope. And we have seen what has happened. The small party is subsumed. The small party sits quietly and the opposition becomes the enemy. And we've seen that here. Must that happen though? I mean, for all we talk about okay. Charanas, mm -hmm. so on. Mm -hmm. If we get people who say at cabinet level mm -hmm. or at the government level, look, mm -hmm. if you push this mm -hmm. big, big brother, Mm -hmm. We will not be able to support you. We don't want the government to fall. Mm -hmm. So please make a decision. Mm -hmm. It's not the kind of political courage we want. And we probably need as much a change in political culture than just just <laughs> well, inclusive so government. We, we need to eradicate uh, yeah, poverty yeah. and we need a castle for everyone. Yeah, but, so if yeah, but Chris, let, let me do more about let, changing let culture. I mean, yes. But when do you change culture? That's a whole long, long story. That's true. And, and culture change by doing we have to people just don't change the culture they change the culture in terms of doing as we are doing and doing things better people change and see that this can happen in a given way I, I, I actually believe that that yes uh, and this political courage you're talking about uh, it is all right, you can do that once, or you can do it twice, and then the next time cabinet reshuffling, you're gone, and then the, you have somebody else that's there. This political culture is not as simple as being brave, because this bravery is not, uh, it's an institution, but government is an institution, and you can be brave, and then what happens? Look at, look at the major changes in this world that you have had. It is not that with people that has come up and be brave in camera. Look, look from uh, Gorbachev. 
Look at that. Uh, you didn't think Gorbachev was brave? I'm a brave after he's in power. Now when he was there, they're mm -hmm. cursing okay, everybody. Go on, go on. Look yeah. at Putin. He mm -hmm. was brave. He wasn't there. Look at uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, in Deng China. Yes, 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 in China. China. These, look at Desmond Wright right here. That's a good example. Desmond Wright right here. Was he brave? No, he was running around kicking on basket with bread. No, what I am saying to you, <laughs> but these men make... He also transformed his party. Uh, yes, but that's yes. after he got into yes. power. So this thing about... I, I've never seen, you know, m m fundamental changes you were asking for happen. Uh, as a result of people externally, so on. External forces are always there to back you. So I actually do believe that the, 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 the system that we have has to provide the operational framework that's going to make our people say that, man, we can trust each other, we can behave in a given way, and so on. And that, in that general way, well, the that cultural itself, change. That, that, exactly, that changes culture. The point I was getting at is, maybe I didn't express, um, I didn't clarify my position. When I say change culture, the culture how we behave, with, we go for efficiency. Yeah. We go for country over party. Mm -hmm. We go for standing up for principle. Mm -hmm. And rather than to say, just inclusive governance and mm -hmm. which which m our constitution mm -hmm. says it um if we can get a government that where ministers this are not permitted and are committed to not using state resources because when you look at what has happened in guyana i think mm -hmm. this is not about political power this is to get your hands on resources mm -hmm. and so it's in that context that that change yeah uh, you can have inclusive governance and yet have very corrupt governance. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, so that's the distinction I'm trying to make. Chris, we, every human has feet of clay. And the Guyanese voter is jaded and skeptical and hard bitten and rightly so. Who is going to stand up and say and be able to persuade anyone on the strength of his word that he has a halo over his head and is going to do all of these wonderful things. The system is not designed to have a messiah. The system must be designed that in the system itself are checks and balances to make the thing work so that there is accountability. We've had enough of deifying our politics. All right, now. okay. Um, I tend to believe that we, we've got the really transformative leaders are those very ones who are prepared to buck the trend. But let's sure. say let's let's go with this. Um, in terms of the, I don't know whether you're still going through your manifesto or, uh, or what document you're going to prepare. But inclusive governance, what do we really mean? By that, I well, what I mean, I mean we have discussed this, but I'm we use the term. But certainly, what I mean is that a governmental system that will allow all the people in Guyana to believe that their interest is being properly addressed. And uh, at an organizational level, it means dealing sensibly with our politics. That means you have to reform, but also including uh, civil societies and other organizations into the into the uh, decision-making process. That is what it actually means to me. Okay. I'm afraid that I take a, a more negative and skeptical view than Henry does. Henry likes to be inclusive and bring the different committees and the different bodies and the different watchdogs in. And I, we've had this discussion many times. And Please understand that this is in the context of a discussion that needs to be had on a larger scale so that unanimity can be met and we can finalize something. Or at but, least some kind of consensus. But, but my view is that government needs to be small, not large, and that the system of accountability cannot involve in every decision-making process that there are 20 different committees you go to, to get mm -hmm. that. So I'm not sure that I agree with that. But we need a framework of accountability. Mm -hmm. And once there is accountability, I think that that will satisfy the electorate. The, for me, inclusive governance is looking at where the purse strings are, who holds the purse strings, and how to control it. The point was made 
in 2015 that all the jobs, all the contracts, all the important positions were held by one type of person. And for that reason, the party which felt excluded, the parties whose supporters felt excluded, were justified in saying to the PPP, we cannot have this anymore, we are going to have a change. Because you have given all the jobs, all the positions to people that look like you. No, they were entirely justified because they were right. But what happened is, after is that, this, is that one hundred percent? What happened after twenty fifteen is that the pendulum swung entirely the other way, mm -hmm. so that no one now can look in the eye of the Indo Guyanese brethren and say it's no fear. There is a fair and equitable distribution of jobs of power in this country, so that if you look in the institutions where people are employed. If you look in the institutions where there are jobs, and jobs are, as you know, scarce, and everybody everybody is scrambling, and unemployment is rising. A thousand people turned the up pendulum, for a job fair yesterday. The yeah. pendulum has swung so that there is no equal unfairness on the other side. So that when the voter goes to the poll and puts his ex next to the party of his ethnicity, he's justified yes. because he knows yes. It's, it's a form of self-interest. Mm -hmm. yes. He's protected. Mm -hmm. he's, no. he's with his scam. But worse than that, he is terrified of the other side winning yes. because yeah. he's out of a job. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a system that everybody is comforted and assured that the employment system, the way that people are recruited, the way that your leaders are chosen, is one that is inclusive. And the only way to do that is where you have both parties involved in that process. Now. You guys and I didn't set out to do this. You, you yourself have chosen to, to differ. How do you resolve this issue so that when you go to the people and you have a consistent message as to what inclusive governance I, really means? No, let me, let me say this. Inclusive governance means that the PVP and the PNC must be involved in the decision making. Agreed. Right at the governmental level. One party can't do it. Even if the PNC maybe give to the uh, well, I always say PNC because the PNC are whatever. But even if they give black people ninety percent of the country, right? If they give it Indian people, for instance, ninety percent of the country, you will still have people out there who can go out there mobilizing and say they ain't use sufficient, mm -hmm. right? So effectively, this is a, a matter in which the people have to have the faith in the people who are making the decisions. Now you're talking something different, different than you're talking about faith. No, 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 no. Making, no, it's not, that's not uh, no, no, not the people. The Indians must believe, oh, well, they already have the faith that the PPP is at the table, the PPP are looking after the interests. Chris, let me give you an and example. The, and uh, look, the, and the Africans must believe that the PNC is at the table and the PNC are making these decisions. And these decisions, they will then come to the notion, uh, to the belief that the decision is in, their, in, is in their interest. But you can't convince one of them about the other. You can't do it. Both parties got to be there making the decision. Let me give you an example. We, we talk about trust and harmony and all kind of thing. It, it doesn't work in the real world. And it's, it doesn't it, work in the real world. There has to be... Trust doesn't work? No. There has to be mutual yes. watchdogging. That's what there has to be. So I will give you an example. In 2015, our bastion of free press, the Chronicle, talked about rivers of blood. In 2018, that same bastion of the free press talked about Judas. So the pendulum swung fully. If the Chronicle was run, and I, I don't think the media should be owned by government at all, I, I don't think, but to use that example, if the board of the Chronicle comprised two PPP members, two PNC members, and one third force member, you would have a neutral and balanced paper in terms of who they hire, the journalists they recruit. Or you can have gridlock. Fine, no, but sorry. gridlock is better than this. Well, because but, but you, would have, you, you would have transparent and open gridlock where the two who are aggrieved will go to the public and say, look at the decisions these people are making. You, you raise an interesting point about, uh, about the press. That is I inclusive think, I think, governance. Yeah, no. Um, th does, does the ANUG have a position on 
government's participation in the media? Should it own television? Should it own radio? Should it own the print media? Now, the, the, the PNC had committed to complete abolition of state ownership in the media. It now, is my view that there should not be state ownership of the media. We have never had a discussion on this That's matter. That's my view. We have, right. we have never had a discussion on, the, on this matter. I believe that if you ha do have, and perhaps in this kind of situation you do need, we'll have to discuss it, it should be based upon a model such as the BBC, mm -hmm. that the government should have very little say in how the thing is run. Very, very little. Uh, I can't see that there, are re there, there might well be reasons why the, the state uh, needs to have uh, some kind, uh, particularly in small countries su such as these, why the state might uh, have to have some kind of uh, uh, presence in, in that area, in, in, in the uh, communications area of that sort. I can see that. But I think that it's the model that you put in place. And uh, again, you think in a situation like Guyana, that's, that's likely to happen in the, even in the medium term? I don't think in a situation like Guyana, as we are today, that you are likely to see the state, as you just said. It's in the manifesto that they will get rid of the... Uh, yeah, that, that was before the APNU. Right. That was before the but APNU. They, uh, if you go in the manifesto of the APNU, they said they will totally liberalize whatsoever that means. Yes. The, the, the no, they were committed. And, uh, yeah, yeah, they were committed. So, to uh, yes, because the, you come to government and I believe you come to realize that if all these institutions are controlled by private individuals, there is a, a good chance that you can be locked out by a few private people. There's no question about it. You could even be if you have a proper code. Code that that, that, that yeah. guarantees access. Well, guarantee I inclusivity type of access because I, I, inclusiveness doesn't mean only at at the parliamentary level or at the government level. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I understand that, but we have seen what's happening even in the larger countries. Where the part in look at Britain, where you have the politicians have got to go and pay homage to these non elected rich owners of newspapers, etc. Now, I am saying to you, I'm not saying you'll ever stop that from happening, but I'm certainly telling you that there are way that they, the my uh, thing would be a framework like, say, the BBC where it is not controlled by the government in the way as such as it is here, and where there are elections for members of the board, they come from various walks of life, they, they come from local authorities that are elected, not, not appointed by ministers and so on, I believe there might well be a place for what I would call an independent, away from even the private sector kind of organization. Tim, you want to add, because I want to pose a direct question yeah. again, on, which you said earlier. Inclusivity and inclusive governance, mm -hmm. meaning that you should bring civil society. You mm -hmm. mentioned civil society specifically. Do you mean bring them in at the governmental and legislative level? Oh, you if, if they don't, if they don't throw their hat in the political... In other words, how do you bring them in if they don't participate well, in elections. Well, well, all right, all right. When I say bring in, I mean, I mean bring them in in the context of what they are. They are civil society. I have a, I have a, a legislation on traffic uh, yes. thing. Okay. I bring this one in to discuss this mat matter with uh, us uh, and, and to see what, how is it that we can proceed. We have a story on corruption. We would like to make strong interventions on corruption. We must uh, talk to the institutions that are involved in this, the UN, Transparency International. We must bring them in in that process. We might, we might give them, they, they should be given voice even at the parliamentary level, but in committee stages and so on. So when I speak about it, I'm not talking about uh, okay. their... Yeah. 
you know, being in government has so but, but that happens now. You do have parliamentary selects. Yeah, yeah. That, uh, that allows... Well, uh, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, you should have that. You perhaps should have more of that. You can even constitutionalize that in a way to, to speak to an uh, advisory civil society group. I think you have something like that in, uh, in Switzerland. So they're, they're a body that they come together, the trade unions, the uh, business sector and others, and they have a national advisory thing, a panel of some form that advise the government because they're important as entities. Tim, I want to pose a direct question to you, and you're free to throw it back at me. Um, you're not known to have been a political animal. You haven't taken part publicly in a lot of political discussions and debates. Um, why have you made this commitment and a very uh, commendable and noble commitment to the entry of polit into politics? I have been practicing law for 20 odd years and I have seen the tug of war that goes on. And I have not seen the kind of improvement in our social structures and political structures that I think can so easily be made. When the AFC started, I was overjoyed. Um, I participated, I helped where I could. Um, I helped them in their original- In the background. From, from the background. Yes. Um, and I celebrated with every success that they had. When the AFC announced their decision um, to join with the APNU, I saw that, like most Guyanese, the PPP had been in power for too long. But I did say to the AFC leadership, I, I won't tell you who, but I did say to them at the time, that the AFC support base relies on their independence and therefore needed to see the AFC make public offers to both parties with conditionalities that we will support you if, so we will support the PPP if they acknowledge their corruption, um, if they take specified steps to, to stop it, and to make a similar offer to the APNU that wasn't done. And because that two-sided approach, that, that approach which would recognize the viability and, and the, the validity of both parties was not done, we now have a situation where we're back to two parties. And I am not a politician. I would be very happy to be quietly ensconced in my office doing my work and looking after my clients. But I do believe that if next elections, whether it happens in 70 days or whether it happens in a year, if when next elections come, Guyanese have only two meaningful choices to put their ex next to. I think that, that by itself returns Guyana to a situation that we were in in the 70s and 80s, where the winner takes all position will rule, and we will never have the kind of constitutional reform that we need, and we will never have the kind of inclusivity that we need, and 49% of the population, whether they are black or brown, will be excluded. And that is not a supportable position. And that is what has driven you. Yes. Henry, I, I can't say you're quite a newcomer. Um, many people might have thought that you were into retirement. Uh, Why did you come out of retirement to get back into active politics, to walk the streets, to go meet pa the, the, the pavement vendors and, and, and the fishermen, the farmers, the gold miners? Yeah, because I think it was I pass. I, as I told you, what I was believe I, what was I no, I'm, I'm going to Okay, good. I have written long before, no, I've started it maybe in 2002, saying that we need to change this, this system and we need to have some kind of shared governance arrangement. Mm -hmm. I went to support the the, the app new. I didn't even support the AFC. 
the DFC to me was a means of wrenching the PVP from office. But it's the APNU that came out, PNCR, that came out with their things about shared governance. We have quarreled a, a with them, I've quarreled with them, about what it exactly they mean and all that. But in their manifesto, they tell us something within what? A couple of days, 90, 100 they, days, 100 100 days. days, they're going to do all this sort of a thing. So I said, they need, and I've said it quite clearly, why I support the people, uh, the, 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 the coalition in the press, it's because they promised myself and many Guyanese that they will change the system, if not within 90 days, certainly within three years. Now, <laughs> if they are not going to do it, and they show no interest in doing it, I'm left with nothing. The PVP had no interest. <laughs> now the party who promised is not doing it. What am I left with? If it is to be done, and too many people were on my email saying, all oh, you're writing, you're all writing, you're all writing. We are doing nothing. You have to do something. So when everybody decided and the jobs come up, I said, yes, I'll be out there with you. Now, I want to ask you guys, uh, the other member, uh, after the withdrawal of Terence Gamble, we'll talk to him about him in a, in a minute, is Ralph Ramkran. We, we don't mm -hmm. know you haven't announced any mm -hmm. other names. Guyana is a big place mm -hmm. relative to population. Mm -hmm. This is intensely hard work. Mm -hmm. Commitment, passion, resources, mm -hmm. sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Do you think, realistically, that you have those things on your side to make the kind of difference that you are setting out to make in the Guyana political culture governance management, etc. Yes, we will do the best that we can. But we do have a groundswell of support that I think is growing. We have a ready-made group of Guyanese that are disillusioned. And I think the word will spread. But to answer your question, do we have the resources to go to the far-flung areas do we have the time and the personnel to go to every bottom house as one party does or to hold large rallies as the other party does? All I can say is that we will do the best that we can. Yes, I, I think, uh, you know, I don't want to make light of what you say because you are right. And uh, my first idea was to ask you what are itemized issues you see that are lacking in us, you know, so that we could m actually make a proper, more objective uh, analysis. But I must remind you that, you know, you remember Fujimori? Mm -hmm. Remember he won Peru? Yes, yes. And you remember all he did was get in his truck with a loudspeaker and went around. Once you have people, that when you hurt people out there, you never know what is that. And I, we believe that a lot of people are just like us. They were promised things, not only this, they promised all sort of things. Pensioners have been promised this immediately as we get into 100% increase of pension. All sort of people have been promised uh, things. But for us, all of these promises are not going to be fulfilled, largely because you cannot hold the government accountable. Because regardless of what this government do, does, it has a solid proportion of the people will support it. We have seen it in Taranda's case again, as I mean. So, so yes, I believe that we are committed. We will try to go do as much as we can do. And people are, you know, people are volunteering to help us. And so we will see how it goes. But we believe that there are people out there. Of course, you need more, than, as a political scientist yourself, yeah, yeah. it needs more than just seeing how it goes. No. You've got to do some serious planning. No, 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 no. Serious well, planning and, when and we say, say we'll I will see get this kind of When we say we'll see how it goes, is after you plan the house okay, that you'll okay. see how it will go. Now, um, and you're welcome again on, on, on this program. 
other faces as well. Now you're gonna find this this Sharon Aspasod issue has brought the question of dual citizenship into the fore and into the psyche of mm -hmm. Guyanese now. You've got campaign finance. Mm -hmm. You've got the complete absence of political party regulation. They could do mm -hmm. what they want. Mm -hmm. And in my view, I've always said that you probably might have noticed. I've always said, if you don't practice democracy at your political party level, you're not going to practice it at the national mm -hmm. level because it's not part of your psyche. You have issues of income and wealth distribution. Oh, that's terrible. You have areas that are very well developed. You have areas very badly developed. These are some of the significant challenges. I, and I'm sure there are many, many other. As we said, you, the very definition of inclusive governance. Mm -hmm. um, the, you, you talked about, um, I, I think, Tim, you wrote a letter in the press in which you talked about um, the, the fear of victimization not being unfounded, real and very immediate. You are going to face Apart from these policy issues, you got some serious um, practical issues. But let's deal with these policy issues. How do you resolve these that have come so much to the fore to say to people, look, you have given us a chance at least to talk to you. Now we got to convince you because that's what you got to do. People are going to listen to you first. Then the next step is the obligation is yours to convince them. How do you convince them on these critical issues? Well, well, for instance, the ones you have policies on, you explain to them your policy and what it is you intend to do. For instance, you speak to party organization, for instance, very important uh, uh, situation. We, w we, have, we have discussed this, but again, not in any uh, you know, way that I could say complete we have half about it more or less, but certainly we will, for instance, we, Ralph is writing some rules for us, and I sent him a bit, I said, remember our contention that if, for instance, if do like the Germans do, I think it's Germany, where if the party promises, makes a promise, and it does not, it appears not to be fulfilling it, members can call and, and quantity of members, and not a lot, yes, yes. can call on the party to tell them why they are not doing it, and they, can s they will then set up an independent committee, independent, not of party, uh, I think, to determine whether or not the party could or could not have carried out these things. Now, there are many rules. Modern party system is not this democratic nonsense centralism that they have here. You said demo, um, Demo <laughs> democratic nonsense. I, I don't think you mean that. I mean democratic centralism. Uh -huh. right? yeah. it's, a, it's a form of thing. That's, that's, uh, that's more centralism than democracy. But, but, but we, we have to be able to say to people, these are the things we intend to do. I don't see anywhere else that we, anything else that we can do. And we have a promise that we will fight for these things. Because remember, we, 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 we are not going on government as such. We will fight for this thing as much as we can. But what else can we do? Uh, I, I cannot see. We will speak to the stakeholders. I told you the other social partners uh, and try to formulate plans that we can force, it, force into government. But, but what I was suggesting, you, you will need to convince they got some, uh, as Tim said, yeah, they are yeah. the ordinary person is quite sophisticated politically. Yeah. They, want, they don't want you to come and, and, and hemming and hawing and ambivalence. Yeah. Yeah. They want to know what is your position yeah. on, say, campaign financing. Yeah. Your, your opponents are all going to be raising money from business people. Yeah. You knew you're going you're gonna to have a hell of a problem. Yeah. What, what lines do you draw? Who do you take money from and who do you refuse? Again, are you going to say, we are, as a political party, we are going to push for, for regulating political parties? Well, yes. Right. I just told you I'd along what lines. I'm glad for your invitation to bring us back on your show. Sure. I noted that when you gave your examples, I was interested that you blurred what to me are two concepts that we need to discuss separately. 
you talked about campaign financing and mm -hmm. the various, which I categorize as part of the various tricks of politics. And then you talked about inequality of wealth. Yes, which I, I was bringing in economic issue you now, the economic which dimension of the policies. As a discussion which is re absolutely required as to what problems our society has mm. and what solutions there mm. are to fix those problems. Now, the average man on the road, and I include myself in that, is much more concerned <laughs> about the second example inequality of wealth. Um, overload of the criminal justice system, how we treat our youths that they don't have any jobs when they come out to university or that they're poorly educated in the first place so that they are condemned for their whole lives to menial labor. Um, those are issues that I hope you will invite us to have a discussion on from time to time. But I think separately, the political tricks issue, the, the how you access wealth, how you keep the power to yourself, how you arrange the structure of the rules so that you exclude the small parties and you keep the power and you keep the um, the wealth and the options for yourself. That is a separate discussion. I wouldn't like us to mix those two. Because I, I think the man on the street wants to hear about how his problems can be solved. And I would like us to have a separate conversation on that if you agree at that some point. But, but, well, always. Uh, and, um, but, but I am suggesting, I, I, I would like to think that I'm as much an ordinary citizen person on the street. You know my base is Alexander Village. Yeah, yeah. Um, that, but I've, I've had the opportunity, I've had the, the experience of, of, of addressing some of these issues. Mm -hmm. And I think if we're going to talk, whilst I agree about inclusive governance, I'm not at entirely convinced that mm -hmm. it has been properly defined. Mm -hmm. What I know has been properly defined is honesty, integrity, efficiency, decency. Um, but if you want to lead in terms of this new culture, and yes, you could be your Fujimori, you could be your Lee Kuan Yew, you, you could be you could be all of these possibilities. Mm -hmm. But you have to be you have to be different. You've got to capture the imagination mm -hmm. of the ordinary person, because you're lucky in some ways. And I don't want to be pontificating. I'm no political scientist. Well, you sound like a politician, Chris. <laughs> I, I was ready to give you. My I, I would be a terrible <laughs> failure if I were a politician. No. In, in some ways, you're lucky because almost everything else has failed. And so you've got a great opportunity. It's how you use that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Now, you, you, we've got two minutes. We've said that the, the, these, these elections, whenever they're going to be held, it's certainly going to be held fairly soon, it would seem, uh, ha have, have accelerated the, the kind of work you're going to do. Will you be able to address these problems? Not, not on play dog only. Yes, you're welcome. But um, among yourselves, uh, you, you defund some issues even on this program. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, uh, because we have not completed discussing uh, all the issues that we, can, we must face. The one for me that's uh, of uh, major importance is the one that you mentioned about youths and uh, education and leaving schools without jobs uh, uh, and so on. That is not necessary. That's, that situation is not necessary. It can be solved. It can be easily solved. We should not have people leaving our school system without, without some marketable qualification. And I mean internationally recognized at various levels. This is, this is a soluble position. But uh, people, I don't know. I mean, I was Minister of Education. I, I know that could be so. But yeah. you go to people with these kinds of things, and uh, they, you, sometimes they don't buy it. Sometimes they don't have money. And so on. But these things can be solved. And we can put them together. And I think it's easy to convince people that uh, the populace that this can happen. The last 45, the last minute is yours, Tim. Um. Henry, as you, the country knows, is an enormously experienced political analyst. So he has his views and he has expressed them in, in many fora about the type of structures that, that he thinks can result in inclusive governance. Um, you have spoken about trust and about honesty and about integrity, and you have said that with a straight face to a Guyanese public that is skeptical and jaded. And that resonates, yes, that's so important. For me, 
there needs to be a system of checks and balances mm -hmm. so that yeah. if someone does not stand up to your test of integrity and honesty but still squeezes into the door, the system of checks and balances will expose him and the transparency that is inherent in such a system will bring it out to light. We need a police watch, uh, a kind of watchdog system. Right. Well, Mr. Timmy Jonas, Dr. Henry Jeffrey, thank you so much for appearing on Play Talk. It's on my test of integrity, but that objective test of integrity. I want to thank you very much for appearing on Plain Talk. Um, I know, it, I know you're still, your, your policies are still evolving. I wish you well. Um, meanwhile, operators and viewers, thank you. Good night, and I'll see you next week.